Lecturing you all about play, that sounds like an evil thing to do. So let's start out with it being a little bit interactive. I want you to turn to your neighbor right now and play a quick game of rock, paper, scissors. I want to hear the winners celebrate. A lot of winners in the audience. OK. So I didn't need to explain the rules of rock, paper, scissors to you all. Because games, they permeate culture, right? And even more embedded in our DNA than games is the simple act of play itself. Apparently, I've been fascinated with this question for a really long time. Here's an audio clip of my dad interviewing me just over 25 years ago about what play. What are some of the favorite things that you like to do, Jonathan? Play. What do you like to play? Games. What kind of games? Board games. What kind of board games? When you get bored. You're a funny guy. I didn't know you were a comedian. Of course, I still don't believe that we only play games because we're bored. We play them for other reasons, with really great benefits. Specifically, we like to play games to interact with simulacra of our everyday problems, but doing it in a really fun way. We take on challenges that we'd never take on any other way. As a five-year-old, I could own property, build hotels. I'd be a lean, mean, money-making machine. And let's just say I'm not president of the United States, so my stint as building mogul stayed with the game. A second reason we love to play games is because we love to be social. We're social by habit. And oftentimes, our ability to accomplish great things are limited by our capacity to interact with each other and communicate. I'll touch on this more later, but let's just say that the whole is sometimes greater than the sum of its parts. Following Monopoly by talking about social skills is a terrible idea. Most game designers hate that game just as much as you and your family despise each other at the end of it. <laughs> this starts to give us a sense for why we play games, but what are they really good for? And are there areas of play that we might be missing? To search the space of play, we first need to define it. Games and play have long avoided the kinds of categorization, formal documentation, or vocabulary to allow for a study of game design. Fed up with this lack of rules, Katie Salen and Eric Zimmerman decided to write them themselves so they, as well as others, could break them. For the sake of my talk, let's just say that play contains many games, and that a key element of all games is play. So while games provides the structure, play provides freedoms. Games researcher Scott Osterweil defined these four freedoms of play, the very first being the freedom to experiment, in which we try new things and learn by doing. The next is the freedom to fail. Sometimes getting something wrong is part of the process and the only way to move forward. Think, press start to continue. Play gives us the freedom to try on new identities. When's the last time you could say, ah, maybe I'll be a plumber, or how about a princess? And what other situations do you find yourself being able to give effort freely? The freedom of effort. The act of play is voluntary. And so the effort required to play is voluntary as well. Those four hours that you put into Settlers of Catan, they didn't come from nowhere. When's the last time you found yourself playing a game and thought, ah, I can't believe I'm being forced to do this? If you were, I'd argue that you weren't actually playing. And that's a pity, because when we truly play, we open our minds and we can learn new things. We can think differently. There are many different types of play, and I'd categorize them on these axes. They can be social or not so social, or physical, not so physical. Putting physical and mental on opposite sides of the axes 
would be missing the point, because in sports, you're both actively calculating and physically acting all the time. You can see how some of the existing games would exist on this space. But what are some of the spaces that we're missing? Are there areas of play that we haven't thought of quite yet? Are there things that we could be practicing for that we haven't yet imagined? It's hard to talk about play without talking about games, because we so often equate the two. But there's a perfect example of play without games, and it's found in Legos. The objective with Legos is to build stuff. The rules are perhaps that you have to use Legos. We learn the physics of building. We invent or reinvent the wheel. Yes, that's a life-size car built out of Legos. And when we build with Legos, we build up and down, left and right, and in these rectangular boxes. We create great variety, but we continue to build up and down, left and right. And these boundaries, they're really difficult to break. If you think about it, the pixels on the screen behind me, they don't have to be arranged in rows and columns. What if we think in different shapes? Could they be organized in circles, or how about the same shape as a sunflower? It's just not the way we've practiced thinking. This led me to invent Troxes. They're an origami-inspired building block set. They're just paper, but when you fold them together, they're based on equilateral triangles. It's the strongest and simplest of shapes. They happen to be found in the way our proteins fold, as well as the crystalline structure of diamonds. When we create with other shapes, do we think differently? The kinds of forms we create with troxes, they're clearly different. They're the kind of forms that Gaudi or Buckminster Fuller, other thought leaders before them, they experimented with. They played with alternative forms. Troxes don't have a goal. They're not a game, but open-ended play. And they might shape the way we think. This is a familiar play space, but thinking outside of the box. Yes, literally. <laughs> Both Legos and Troxes they're abstract systems of relatively low complexity, but the kinds of problems we deal with daily are far more complicated, and we deal with those unintended consequences of complicated systems. All games are systems of varying complexity. In 2012, I was part of a game design studio called Potion. We were contracted by the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago to design games that I like to call massively multiplayer offline games. People were challenged to build their future Chicago. The catch, as almost all games have catches, was that you had limited energy supply, and you had to build the future uh, Chicago with that limited supply and do it responsibly. When you enter the space, it was as if you put on magic goggles that you could see energy flowing into and out of everything around you. People would build their city in an efficient way and allow for recreational sites like skate parks or uh, new bike lanes. We had to reward the viewers, not viewers, we had to reward the players to see how the simple singular actions would result in consequences or the success of their city later on. I'd played games before, but I'd never created them. And this simple act of a simple action, uh, creating far more complex and uh, unintended consequences, really struck me. So what is the systems thinking I keep talking about? Well, before systems thinking, the way of thinking was mechanistic thinking. Right? If we saw the simple singular parts, we thought we knew the whole system. This is kind of like a puzzle. There's one way, typically, to solve this problem. 
Systems thinking, in contrast, is the space in between. We're looking at the interaction of the parts, and this is where the whole is greater than simply the sum of its parts. Building on this work of building games, I joined the MIT Media Lab and expanded on building games about the whole becoming something greater than the parts. Meet Blinks. Blinks are enchanted tabletop game components. They're ticklish, which means they respond to touch. They're social, which means they communicate with their neighbors. They allow us to play games that we could never play before. Did I mention they love to play games? Here they're playing a game called Mortals. In the game of Mortals, each blink is dying. It only has 60 seconds to live, and the only way to live longer is to steal life from the neighboring blinks. When it attacks, it steals five seconds from each of the blinks that attach to it, plays a lot like chess, but the board feels alive. It's not quite Jumanji, but you get a sense. Troxes and future energy and blinks, they're just some of the examples of play that encourage systems thinking. This space is rich and filled with possibility for both players and game makers alike. It's commonly said that systems thinkers, they see the big picture. They have the ability to create championship teams or build ethical companies or create a better city. They might just be able to save the planet. This kind of thinking allows for longer-term planning, and that's something that feels undervalued in our current society. Let's put on our sports cap for a moment. When the 100-year-old sport of baseball was approached the same way by coaches and players for hundreds of years, somebody came around, Nate Silver, and approached it from a systems thinking point of view. He's now known for Moneyball, and he changed the way the game is played. He made a team more than simply the sum of their parts, and they were champions. Nate Silver is just one example of systems thinking being applied in the real world. Systems thinking isn't nerdy. Unfortunately, it's often presented that way. And systems thinkers, they don't actively think, now I'm going to put on my systems thinking cap. They must have practiced this way of thinking. And play happens to be one of our freest forms of practice. So Jonathan, what games should we be playing this weekend? I know you're all asking yourselves right now. There's no single game that I can tell you will make you smarter. But I will tell you to play games that go against the status quo, ask you to think differently, try on new identities. They cross boundaries where you're challenged and engaged both physically and mentally. New kinds of play are possible with the interactivity of digital games and the social aspects of board games that have come before them. This new kind of interaction, it'll allow us to engage with dynamic systems that we're part of and are creating. A generation of systems thinkers is a generation that's prepared for the path we're already paving. Thanks so much, and come play with me.